As we continue to examine the evidence concerning Jesus' resurrection, we now turn to one of our earliest Christian documents, 1 Corinthians. The scholarly consensus is that it was written sometime between 50 and 60 CE by a fellow named Paul. Some have questioned both the dating and the authorship, but we'll assume these parameters for now. If the Gospels and Acts are a later tradition containing legendary or even fictional details, we would expect the earlier writers, such as Paul, to know less about Jesus. In fact, this is exactly what we find, and boy do we find it. Except for the reference to the Lord's Supper in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, which incidentally has been altered from the original, Paul mentions no other sayings, teachings, or miracles of Jesus in any of the seven genuine Pauline epistles. Paul doesn't place Jesus in the recent past, and there are many clues scattered throughout his writings that support the idea that Paul's Jesus was never on earth. As for Jesus' death and resurrection, it could be said that Paul was obsessed with both. As such, you would think we'd learn more about the resurrection from Paul than any other New Testament writer, but, strangely, we learn almost nothing beyond the fact that Jesus was resurrected. But in his first letter to the Corinthian believers, there is a passage where he suddenly shares a few details beyond the core belief that Jesus was resurrected. In the 15th chapter, Paul claims that over 500 people saw Jesus simultaneously and that he appeared to the original 12 disciples and all of the apostles who were not direct disciples. Paul even says that Jesus was buried. And since Paul seems completely unaware of the Gospels and Acts, this passage constitutes an independent and arguably earlier claim that is in no way hindered by the fact that the Gospels and Acts might be purely fictional. So what do we make of this passage? For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He hath been raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, and that He appeared to Cephas, then to the Twelve, then he appeared to above five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain until now, but some are fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, as to the child untimely born, he appeared to me also. There are numerous references to Jesus' resurrection in the New Testament outside of the Gospels and Acts, and not once is there a mention of Jesus' empty tomb. The closest we get is Paul telling us that Jesus was buried, and that is found in verse 4 of this passage. The face value intent of this passage seems to be to provide some kind of supporting evidence to back up the claim that Jesus in fact did rise from the dead, but we'll see later that this is not at all what Paul had in mind. But let's assume that this was Paul's intention. Wouldn't it be a great time, no, scratch that, the perfect time for Paul to tell his readers that Jesus was not just buried, but buried in Joseph of Arimathea's tomb, and that this tomb was now empty, and that anyone who wanted could visit the tomb, and maybe even talk to some of the disciples who certainly would have still been alive just 20 years after Jesus' death, as this passage even admits. Wouldn't some actual details go a long way toward convincing the skeptics? Where was Jesus buried, Paul? When was Jesus buried, Paul? What about all of the post-resurrection details we find in the Gospels? Inquiring minds want to know. But the strange absence of details regarding Jesus' life death, burial, and resurrection is systemic in Paul's letters. It forces us to ask why. Why would Paul forego mentioning 99.9% .9 of the gospel details 
throughout all his epistles when the very subject of his letters is allegedly the very Jesus of the Gospels. Paul claims that Jesus was buried and there can be no quibbling about the face value meaning. The Greek in question, phopto, means to be buried as you might think, but as always, it pays to look at the context. As we shall see, Paul attributes this knowledge of Jesus' burial not to a recent event that happened just a few years earlier, not to an event that happened only a few miles from Paul's stomping ground, and not to any oral tradition, but oddly enough, to Scripture. And that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the Scriptures. Now, we might rightly ask about punctuation. Is it possible that Paul was not linking Jesus' burial to a scriptural prophecy? I don't think so, especially when the knowledge of the burial of Jesus comes from the famous Isaiah 53 prophecy that the suffering servant had made his grave with the rich. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, though he had done no violence nor was any deceit in his mouth. Strange that this prophecy is actually written in the past tense, as if the events had already occurred in Isaiah's time. But back to the issue of the source of Paul's gospel. We can further bolster the claim that Jesus' burial was known from the Isaiah passage by simply examining the previous verse. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures. My, my, this is quite odd. Paul tells us that Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection were according to the Scriptures. If Jesus really lived and was crucified and buried and rose from the dead as the Gospels say, and only 20 years prior to Paul's letter, why does Paul claim it is Scripture that informs us about Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection? He pointedly ignores all of the gospel details concerning Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection and claims that the Jewish Scripture, Isaiah 53, Psalms 22, and so on, is how we know about this new gospel of his. But some may counter by saying that Paul isn't saying that he learned about it from Scripture, but that the events are simply in line with the Old Testament prophecies. Jesus rose from the dead in accordance with Scripture. Kata graphe. This is the phrase translated in most versions of the Bible as according to the Scriptures. The word graphe is literally translated as writings not scriptures. Of course, Paul is talking about the scriptures, but the word graphe does not mean scriptures. It means writings. Translators try to translate what they think is the real intention of the word or phrase, and sometimes this non-literal translation can actually cover up the true meaning. But in this case, however, scriptures is an acceptable rendering. Kata, however, can have various meanings such as according to, against, after, by, in, during. It seems this word was quite the Swiss army knife. In accordance with also fits, but it gives the connotation that Paul found out about the gospel via oral tradition, or maybe a direct revelation from Jesus, and only later realized that what happened historically lined up with the prophecies. I think Paul is saying something closer to based upon Scripture and Scripture alone. And shortly, you'll see more clearly why I believe this. But for now, just a quick piece of evidence to show you that kata can mean a variety of things. Anyone who is not against us is for us. Certainly here, the word could not mean in accordance with or according to. But before I show you the clincher here, I'd like to pose some questions relating to this strange reluctance on Paul's part 
to mention any of the gospel details about Jesus' life. Could it be that the early Christians did not know about the earthly Jesus of Mark because Mark had not yet brought Jesus down to earth in his Homeric allegory? Could it be that the earliest Christians believed in a heavenly Jesus whose act of salvation had been accomplished long before mankind walked the earth, but was finally being revealed during the first century to people like Paul and from the prophetic scriptures at that? Kata Grafe. And what about this gospel Paul claims he received? How did Paul receive it? Oral tradition from a ground zero event 20 years earlier, only a few miles away? Why don't we let Paul answer this one himself? But I certify to you, brethren, that the gospel, that is, Jesus' existence, death, burial, and resurrection, which was preached of me, is not from man, for I neither received it from man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. Most translations render it revelation of Jesus Christ, not revelation from Jesus Christ. Jesus was revealed to Paul, but not by any man. But if other men were not doing this revealing, and Jesus himself was not doing the revealing, where did Paul get this information about Jesus? Paul already told us in the first Corinthians verses we just looked at, but he tells us again in Romans, and this time we don't need to argue over the meaning of kata. Now to him who is able to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery, the gospel, kept secret since the world began and later encoded into prophetic scriptures, but now made manifest or revealed and by the prophetic scriptures, dia grafe prophetikos, made known to all nations, according to the commandment of the everlasting God for obedience to the faith. By the prophetic scriptures, the gospel was made known to all nations. Incredible! In corroboration of 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4, Paul tells us that the gospel of Jesus was hidden since the beginning of the world and revealed to people in his day, and in fact, to the entire world, not by recent events, not by oral tradition, but by God revealing Jesus from the pages of the Old Testament.